everyone, welcome to The Hard Answers, I'm Tom Graham. What is justice? Is a question that philosophers have been struggling with for a very long time. There is a 12-hour series created by Harvard called Justice, What's the Right Thing to Do? It's the recording of all the lectures in an entire semester of a political philosophy class at Harvard. I highly recommend watching it. You can see the link to the Harvard series in the description below. Army. In a state of nature, before civilizations, before governments, we lived in families and survived any way we could. Although we were mostly peaceful, and most of our skirmishes with our neighbors had to do with territorial boundaries, we had the right to steal, to kill, to rape, and to enslave if we had to in order to ensure our survival and the survival of our children. Eventually, we consented to be part of a civilization, and that consent consisted of loaning our rights to steal, to kill, to rape, and to enslave to an authority, a government, giving them the exclusive authority to use force. We consented to be governed in exchange for a legitimate expectation of certain entitlements, the protection of rights, justice, equality under the law, law enforcement, and maybe even a safe childhood and an equal starting point in adult life through a good basic education. When the state fails to meet these legitimate expectations, those rights we loan to the government revert back to us and we can exercise them morally. Each of us is a member of several different societies, family, institutions, community, state, nationality, and sometimes our obligations to these different forms of society, these different societies conflict. Loyalty seems to be the way we decide how to resolve conflicts when membership obligations conflict. For those of us who believe in God, we are more loyal to God than our family. Our, we're more loyal to our family than we are to schools or institutions, more loyal to our country or state than to schools or institutions. If you saw your child, and a child you didn't know, drowning, and you could only save one, which would you save? Would you call the police if you caught your sibling breaking the law? Would you tell the school if you caught your roommate cheating on a homework assignment? Our larger society must realize and accept conflicting loyalties. Your place and society's place. The needs of the many typically outweigh the needs of the few, but individuals are not available for any use society might have for us. Where unalienable rights are concerned, life, liberty, the pursuit of property, the needs of the individual outweigh the needs of the many. If a doctor can save a hundred people by killing you and harvesting your organs, society does not have the right to your organs your right to defend yourself, and even deeper, your right to take back those rights you loaned to the government, if it fails you, is of the utmost importance. Our country was founded by people who believed that the government failed them, and so they rebelled against the king, as was their right, as was their duty. Any law that tries to curb your ability to take your rights back when morality demands it should be seen as unjust. A law that says you cannot secede from the Union under any circumstances is unjust, just as timeshare memberships that make it near impossible for you to cancel are unjust. The United States is a nation of laws and rights first, a democracy second. Otherwise we would have mob rule and lynch mobs. The majority does not get to decide everything. In fact, there is a very limited number of things the majority should be able to decide. There are two large things that modern states today do that are unjust. Number one, paternalistic laws. Protecting people from themselves with safety belt laws, helmet laws, and even Social Security and Medicare programs are all unjust. They may be helpful and compensate for human nature and reduce the burden of the state, but they are still unjust. Any taxation that redistributes wealth from rich to poor is unjust because society is asserting a collective property right on the individual's labor. Worse yet, it can be considered slavery of the individual to the collective. These types of taxes and benefits also create cottage industries of free riders. So what does your society owe you? 
a fair shot at happiness. Feudal, aristocratic, and caste-based societies don't respect rights and are simply unjust. The free market, where voluntary exchange decides the distribution of wealth, is an improvement over aristocratic and caste-based systems because jobs and careers are open to anyone and everyone can compete. But a free market system will be biased in favor of people through no merit of their own. We're born into affluent families and that too is unjust. A meritocracy has a free market but also prepares the children of the society so everyone starts at roughly the same starting line thus ensuring equality of opportunity. But even here, people who are the fastest will win, and if them being fast was not their doing, that's not just either. Government can only do so much and respect the rights of everyone to pursue happiness as fast as they can. As long as people are given a safe and healthy childhood, a good basic education, and an economy free from discrimination based on arbitrary attributes like race, marital status, nationality, or sexual preference, that is all that society can be expected to give. A fair starting point, so everyone has a fighting chance to achieve whatever version of happiness they want to pursue. Taxation to support governmental institutions is not unjust. The citizen has consented to the tax by being a citizen and partaking in the benefits of being a citizen a justice system, law enforcement, roads, etc. Taxation to pay for infrastructure that ensures justice to all children in a society is a legitimate expectation of living in a society that values justice. A progressive tax that taxes the wealthier more with the assumption that they partly achieve their wealth based on arbitrary factors also is just. As long as the tax as long as the taxes collected pay for institutions to help children achieve an equal starting point and are not given and are not used to give monetary benefit to another class. Providing benefits to economically disadvantaged adults without obligating them to work creates a cottage industry of free riders. So any redistributive justice must be in the form of institutions that benefit children and not adults. However, the government can justly hire economically disadvantaged adults for make-work programs or partner with private industries to get these people working to justly earn their keep. Fairness in the economy. Affirmative action makes our society face the fact that the unjust government policies of the past have placed some groups of our society into economically disadvantaged positions in our society. But if we shape policies to correct for this by giving benefits based on the same arbitrary factors, for instance, to benefit black people over white people, then we also give benefit to affluent black people over economically disadvantaged white people, or black immigrants over white immigrants, which is a perversion of the program's intent. Instead of trying to give people benefits based on their arbitrary attributes, we should tailor our benefits to help all the economically disadvantaged people move up the economic ladder. And that should only be accomplished through funding to institutions to help their children, or through make-work projects. If affirmative action is in the form of preferential treatment, college admissions, or hiring preferences, then that too should be based on the damaged class, i.e. the economically disadvantaged not skin color or national heritage. Black or white does not tell you how affluent the applicant is, nor the genealogy, nor the history of disadvantage in their lineage, and will not accomplish the intent of reparations. But one based on current economic status helps the historically as well as the recently disadvantaged. How will the government pay for what it owes you? Taxation. Taxation by consent is not coerced and, if done appropriately, is just. Taxation is necessary to pay for governmental needful things. Institutions like courtrooms, legislatures, the Secretary of State Office, or the Department of Motor Vehicles Office, the military, and schools all have to be paid from taxes. Taxes for all these things are just. 
Roads are paid for by usage taxes on gasoline and vehicle registrations. The more you use roads, the more taxes you pay for them. Walmart and UPS pay tens of thousands of times more than you do for roads. Usage taxes are almost always just. Schools tend to be paid for by property taxes, which can be looked at as both just and unjust. Just in the fact that everyone with children should bear the burden, and a tax based on the value of your home allows children from low wealth households to share the same basic education as children from high wealth households. But taxing people who don't have and will never have children in school might be thought of as unjust. Recently, the federal government has been in the business of taxpayer-funded grants to schools, which the schools qualify for by complying with the federal government's requirements. The federal government knows the schools will become dependent upon these grants and sometimes uses these to coerce the state schools into meeting federal goals. Do what we say or lose the grant money. This stinks of coercion. The natural distribution of wealth is just for two reasons. One, justice in acquisition. Did they get the capital justly to build their business? Borrowing from a bank or selling shares on the open market to gain capital is almost always just. However, receiving money from a relative might be seen as unjust. But ironically, the people who would see this as an unjust thing seems to think that poor people receiving benefits from the government is completely just. Which doesn't make any sense whatsoever. 2. Justice in Voluntary Transfer Two parties, voluntarily trading, each values what they are trading less than what they are receiving. So in the end of every trade, both parties involved in the trade walk away wealthier. If people justly provide things people want, cars, cell phones, entertainment, food, then the profits, no matter how large, are just. Government takings are different from taxation. Takings are when the government takes something from a specific person or group for the benefit of society. Usually property is taken for some public utility. The government cannot justly take property from one individual or group for the use of the collective unless society justly compensates that individual or group. The person has to be paid for the property before the electric company can get their land. Taxing one group, the rich, for the benefit of another, the poor, without compensating the rich, is equivalent to slavery and is immoral. The rich have already paid their obligation to the society by providing a service or a good and paying taxes to share the burden of government. Additional taxation on that group to provide for another group is not just. However, Giving every child in a society an equal starting point through a good basic education and a safe, healthy environment in which to learn is a legitimate expectation of entitlement for the members of society and is a proper role of government. A progressive tax applied uniformly and earmarked specifically for institutions that give all children a safe and healthy educational environment is indeed a just tax. Spending could include additional police presence, teachers, school infrastructure, three meals a day, extended school hours, and tutoring for children with parents who are unable to help them with homework. When do the rights you loaned the government revert back to you? If the government becomes despotic, the people's rights revert back to them, and they have the duty to revolt. If four people in a lifeboat are on an ocean with no contact with society and they haven't eaten in over 15 days, are starving and they will all die without food, then society has failed them and all their natural rights revert back to them and they will do what they have to do to survive, including resorting to cannibalism. If a country has an AIDS epidemic and a pharmaceutical manufacturer will not affordably sell the drugs they need to survive, then the people will do what they have to do. The society has failed them. 
their right to steal reverts back to them and they can justly steal from the manufacturer directly or by purchasing generics from countries that don't respect patent rights. The government must protect the rights of the rich minority, but at the same time must also ensure that the c conditions of the poorest citizens aren't such that they feel that society has abandoned them and therefore regain their natural rights to steal, rape, and enslave to survive, as they would in a state of nature. What can you sell? During the Civil War, soldiers were conscripted, but had the option of hiring someone to take their place. Of course, this system benefit, benefited the rich far more than the poor. Not only does it allow the rich to get out of the draft, it incentivizes the poor to put themselves in danger. Not through coercion, but through motivated consent. If you can sell your entire body into military service, or any service for that matter, why can't you sell your kidney or any other organ? I believe you should be able to because you have clear title to them, which is more than you can say for your land or your home, which many other organizations have rights to. Can you sell your baby? No. The baby belongs to itself, not to you. Selling a baby is treating it as if it's property, like a slave. You don't get to do that. Wrapping it all in a bow. So what is justice? The quality of being just. So what is being just? Acts done or made according to principle and guided by reason, morality, and fairness. What is morality? Morality is differentiating between right and wrong. What makes an action morally worthy has to do with the motive of the act, the intent. Goodwill is not good because of its accomplishments. Goodwill is good in and of itself. You can't buy your way into heaven through good acts. But what if your motive is selfish? If you do something because it will inconvenience you, to do otherwise, that action has no moral worth, and in certain cases it can be considered immoral. But what if you do something because you know that it will make you feel like a slime bucket if you don't? Isn't that selfish? Doesn't that get rid of the moral worth? No, it doesn't. It's fine to have feelings and thoughts that support doing the right thing. If you're motivated to do the right thing because you wouldn't want to feel like a slime bucket by not doing the right thing. It's your reverence to duty, to doing the right thing, that is your motivation. And you know your motivation is so strong, you'll feel badly when you don't do the right thing. So being motivated by not wanting to feel like a slime bucket is an incredibly moral motivation. If your motive is what makes an action morally worthy, then when the Spartans killed their newborn children who were less than physically perfect, they were performing a moral act, since their intentions were to save the child from a life of being ostracized, and to save other soldiers from a weak link, which might save the nation from an army that got through that weak link. Even abortion, if done for the right reasons, can be moral. Former FBI Director James Comey gave testimony in Congress dealing with Hillary Clinton's inappropriate use of email. He said that Hillary was extremely careless when handling classified information, but he could not but he did not feel that she committed a crime because he could not determine ill intent. This brings up another question. Can we have laws that punish regardless of intent? We have negligent manslaughter when somebody did something intentionally that led to a person being killed unintentionally. When national security is at stake, especially in high offices like the Secretary of State, should the people in those positions know better? And should we have criminal punishments for people who are extremely careless with our top secret information? I think we should. There is no categorical imperative, because when you invoke phrases like the good, the imperative becomes subjective. The best we can do is to come up with a system of justice in which we would like to live regardless of our arbitrary attributes. Wealth, social status, economic circumstances, color, religious beliefs, or national origin. 
Because people disagree on what the good life is, we shouldn't create a society that promotes a single good life. It's one thing to support a fair framework of rights, within which people can pursue their own conceptions of the good life. It's something completely different and runs the risk of coercion to base law or principles of justice on any particular conception of the good life. We can come up with a list of rights to respect, but it is impossible to come up with a list of social goods that everyone can agree on. Providing a basic standard of living for the poor or the elderly may be good from your perspective, but may be completely immoral from the perspective of a large portion of your society. Democracy cannot be the answer because democracy will always discriminate against the minority. Be that black, Latino, Asian, or even the very rich. Discrimination is not acceptable because individuals are not for the use of society. To figure out what justice is in a particular situation, we need to look at our judgments and come up with moral principles based on those judgments. Then revisit the judgments and retool the judgments to more closely fit the principles we've derived. So we need to come up with a list of situational imperatives that we can apply to other cases when they come up in the future. When deciding what is just in a situation, one of the principles used is to figure out the purpose or the telos of the activity when we're trying to figure out how to justly regulate it. We need to ask what qualities, what excellences will be honored via regulation? Should the PGA be able to ban a disabled person from playing golf because they are unable to walk the course? Or are the excellences being honored by the game of golf, the ability to get the ball in the hole? The purchase the purpose of marriage is far more than honoring a couple for their commitment to reproduce. It's about companionship, friendship, solidarity, partnership when addressing all the issues life throws at you. So should we ban gay people from getting married simply because they are unable to procreate? Or because we don't approve of their sexual activities? Should we deprive gay people of their married survivor automatic legal standing after their spouse dies rights? Our property rights, rights to social security benefits, rights to, the rights to the deceased person's pension, rights you are honored with because you have good sexual activities and good reproductive ability, giving everyone equal access to the same societal and legal benefits is the only way a society can be just. Please click the subscribe button to see more videos like this. If you disagree with me, please leave a comment. My ears are always open and I learn new things every day when people disagree with me. I'm Tom Graham. I'll see you later on The Hard Answers.